Hello. Hi. 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 Hello. I'm curious about. I'm curious about. I'm curious I'm about. Curious about. I'm curious about building open, authentic, loving relationship. I'm curious about jealousy. I'm curious about polyamory. Does it just mean that you're fucking all the time? How can I tell my parents that my partner is already married? I'm curious about... How do you know when you're too busy to have another relationship? I'm curious about dominant and subordinate relationship. I'm curious about sexual health. How can relationships, How can relationships evolve, evolve with people evolve as they grow and change? Grow and change? it allows for folks to feel less alienated, like to feel like, oh, this, the scripture does include me. And oh, mm -hmm. if I really do the research, if I look at it with curiosity, if I think about context, like there is, there are deeper messages here that can be pulled Absolutely. out. And so that's really interesting. It's like, it feels like a treasure hunt where it's like, it's something that you thought you knew now revisited. And so mm -hmm. I'm interested in that idea. Yeah. I love that idea of a treasure hunt, whereas sometimes people feel like in-depth study of the Bible is more like a, a, a minefield yeah, <laughs> as nice. opposed to find treasure. So I love that idea. Yeah. Welcome to the Curious Fox podcast for those challenging the status quo in love, sex and relationships. My name is Effie Wu. And I'm Jacqueline Misla, and on today's episode, we've invited back the incredible DeAndrea Blalek Johnson to talk about sex in the Bible. Consider this the Curious Fox version of an Easter special. <laughs> the only angle that has inspired me to look at the Bible with any real interest. <laughs> So we have just posted the last episode of the Infidelity Trilogy <laughs> via a process that was more excruciating than we have the energy to describe. We literally volunteered with no prompt from anybody else to mm -hmm. pick apart the wounds of our past in front of an audience of several thousand and spent weeks writing and recording some of the most painful, embarrassing, and traumatic moments of our lives. And then we thought, you know what it might be nice to follow that trip down traumatic lane? Let's have a conversation about religion. <laughs> Another source of great trauma for me, which has deformed our collective view of sexuality, resulting in centuries of shame and suppressed people. So maybe our next episode should be about our relationship with our mothers or <laughs> we can do our taxes live on air. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what other topic we can choose to unearth our deepest hurts and deepest fears. <laughs> no joke. Honestly, after this, I wanted to talk about butt plugs and pickup lines for a couple of episodes. <laughs> So, I mean, that said, if we were going to go down this journey, we, at least we have the guidance of the fantastic D'Andrea of Laylock Johnson mm -hmm. to help us look at a Bible with new eyes. D'Andrea is a clinical social worker who has worked in the field of behavioral health for almost 15 years. Through her practice, Sankofa Sex Therapy, she conducts workshops on sexuality and intimacy and works with individuals with all types of relationships, many through the lens of Christianity and faith. D'Andrea is a member of the Leadership Collective of Women of Color and Sexual Health Network. She serves as a facilitator in the Theater of War Productions and as a catalyst for positive change. The Andrea actually joined us on episode 42, where she blew our minds and challenged the long-held misbeliefs about spirituality and sexuality. It was really for the first time that I had spoken to someone who was not only religious and knowledgeable about religion, but she could quote scripture, provide historical and social context, and unpack the layers of misinformation to strip the biblical word down to its core in a way that felt relatable and align with the values of love, compassion, self-expression, physical connection, and wholeness. Honestly, as a person who grew up without a prescribed faith, the conversation with her restored my faith in religion a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I've always been fascinated in the Bible because professionally, as someone who works in institutional, social, and individual change, in storytelling, and in the alignment or disconnection between one's truths, one's values, one's self-expression, the Bible feels like a fascinating example of the impact that storytelling can have individually and globally. 
And personally, I have a complicated relationship with religion and faith. You can listen to episodes 32 and 42 for more on that story. The short version, my church and my upbringing made it really hard for me to reconcile my sexual expression and my faith. It wasn't until decades later that I found faith-based communities that were more focused on social justice than on sin more focused on celebrating the fact that we are all fearfully and wonderfully made than on shame and condemnation. Communities that promoted exploration and contextualization. Communities that invited my pansexuality, my polyamory, and my curiosity to sit alongside my faith. I, on the other hand, until a few weeks ago, knew very little about the Bible. I have never really had a good reason to take a deep dive into the word. Then Jacqueline suggested we do this Easter special, Curious Fox Way. And there was my reason. And no, I didn't read the whole book that was written over almost 20 centuries, translated into 2,000 languages that divided and united people and civilizations in a week. But... I did do a bunch of research into sex in the Bible. And I have to say, my research kicked off with a disappointing start. We at Curious Fox hold curiosity and feminism at the top of our value system. If you've been listening to us for a while, you know this. And the whole book starts with God casting Adam and Eve out of Eden because Eve gets curious and succumbs to her hunger for knowledge. Literally. And she eats a fruit from the tree of knowledge. And then, as if being cast out isn't enough, she then gets the pain of childbirth and menstruation as punishment for eternity. Mm -hmm. Apparently, everybody knows this but me. I'm not impressed. (laughs) I feel like the only way to find faith is through exploration. And the only way to explore is through curiosity. Faith without curiosity is blind faith. And blind faith will only make you bump into things, some of which can hurt a lot. Yeah, absolutely. The Bible and the faith around those words and those collections of stories have wielded tremendous power over the course of centuries. As I was researching for this episode, I couldn't help but feel that the Old Testament feels a lot like Game of Thrones, which at some point I had to stop watching because of all the violence, especially sexual violence. And then Jesus comes along and it becomes very Harry Potter. (laughs) And then everyone's like, yay, the war, the famine, the persecution of Old Testament's over. Hashtag Jesus, hashtag Christianity. (laughs) Exactly. And like Harry Potter, everyone's like, let me choose my house. I'm Protestant. I'm Baptist. I'm Methodist. I'm Lutheran. (laughs) (laughs) That's really what it feels like. On an ever so slightly serious note. I think the study of the Bible and any religious text is essential to put stories into context. Biblical scripture has long been used to cast fear and judgment and shame when it comes to sexuality. But many of us are not clear about how those particular stories made it into the holy book. The scriptures are full of tales of love and lust. Adam and Eve, Sodom and Gomorrah, the 700 wives of King Solomon, Jesus and the adulteress are but a few of these stories. Indeed, sex is an integral part of the Holy Scripture. And so, on this Easter special episode, Deandra helps us on an Easter egg hunt to find references of sex and sexuality that have been hidden in plain sight. She invites devoted followers of the word and those who choose brunch over the Bible on any given Sunday to revisit what they know about those millennial old parables. And we invite you to put those Sunday school stories to the side and join us as we re-examine the Bible from a very different perspective. In preparing for the conversation with you, I kept thinking about how important language and words are in the Bible and how people will recite scripture either to restore their faith in those dark moments, to condemn someone and to show judgment, to feel rooted to history and context. Like people hold on to those words. And I think what's so interesting is those words are translations of words, which are translations of words, which are translations of words. And there are so many clues in the original text that 
I think those translations over the course of the generations may have diluted. And for somebody, and we've had you on the show before and talked about my personal conflict with faith and and spirituality and sexuality and the Bible and religion, and words had a big piece of that. Words felt condemning. And I think that in conversation with you, words have felt healing in revisiting things in the Bible. And so I wanted to kind of start from that space first by from a place of gratitude and saying thank you for inviting me to revisit the Bible and my faith in a different way, in a way that has felt less alienating. Oh, thank you so much for that. I am so glad that I was able to provide that space for you. So that means a lot. That means a lot. I really do appreciate it. And so as we talk about words, I wanted to kind of start there. I think that for centuries, religious folk have leveraged the Bible to create fear and shame around sexuality. But there's a lot of sex in the Bible. Oh, it's a whole lot of sex. (laughs) (laughs) It's a whole lot of sex. And all of it wasn't in a bad situation, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's lots of sex in the Bible and even places where it's seen as a beautiful exchange of energy and love between people who weren't married, Mm. by the way. But yeah. Yeah. Lots of sex in the Bible. Yeah. And even that, just that little thing that you just said, and they weren't married, like that feels like so many years of my life in church was around. (laughs) You've got to make sure that you're married. So I am wondering if you can give some examples of some passages that we maybe need to revisit. And let me, let me give some context there. I follow you on social media. And if people do not follow you on social media, they absolutely should, because it is fantastic. And one of the stories that you shared was from someone who you followed, and they were talking about a story in the Bible and sharing, you know, that what it first appears to be is that there's actually more to it than that. And it made me think that the Bible is a little bit of a treasure hunt. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a little bit, if you apply context, if you apply some etymology, if you like really kind of pull back the curtain and look beyond what you hear at the pulpit, there's some real stories in there. Oh, it's some real, stuff gets real, really real, really real. (laughs) Thinking specifically about the story of Ruth and Boaz. And so I think about how within faith communities, their relationship is touted as like, this is what you want your marriage to be. And you want to be like Ruth found in the field working for your Boaz or, you know, something like that. Like, mm-hmm. These are the random things I've heard specifically at women's conferences. So for those who are not familiar, here's a quick version of the story. Naomi is married to Elimelech. And they have two sons, Maloon and Chilion. They leave their hometown of Israel because of famine. And Elimelech dies, and the sons get married to women from another tribe, one of whom is named Ruth. The sons eventually die, and now the three widows live together, trying to figure out how to live in a time where connection to a man is important for survival. The women go back to Israel in the hopes of finding some food and end up working for a relative of Elimelech's to harvest barley. Boaz, a relative of Elimelech, who owns the field, takes a liking to Ruth. And so Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, has an idea. She says, my daughter, I must find a home for you, where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight, he's going to be winnowing barley in the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know that you're there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he's lying, and then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. Within that story, there is a passage where it talks about Ruth uncovering Boaz's feet. And so it's important to understand that feet is uh, used as a euphemism for genitalia of, of any gender, actually. But specifically within this passage, it says that Ruth uncovered his feet on the threshing floor. And so within that context, 
also with the way in which that word was used at that time and in writings and not just in what we canonized in the Bible, but other writings of the time, it was used as a euphemism for feet. The book of Ruth continues. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? He asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are the guardian redeemer of our family. Yeah, it's important to to know that that's what was going on. She wasn't giving him a foot massage. (laughs) She (laughs) may have been massaging something else. It's a possibility, could be. But yeah, it's just important to understand that context and also the different words that were used and why they were used. The next morning, Ruth slips out before anyone can see her, but not before Boaz gives her six measures of barley so that she doesn't leave empty handed. Naomi's plan works. and Eventually, Boaz pays off the debt from the land of Elimelech and marries Ruth. And the women are once again taken care of. See, that's what I'm saying. This has all the makings of a best selling story. Death, power, sex. <laughs> yeah, the damsel in distress. <laughs> exactly. As I did my biblical deep dive, I found so many stories where sex was used as an act of violence or power. I'm wondering, are there stories in the Bible where sex is seen as something intimate and beautiful? Yeah, well, you know, I think about how I have not heard very many sermons where the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs was the text Mm. where the pastor or priest preach specifically from from that area. And often uh, when looking at that book, people, instead of taking it at face value of a relationship between two lovers, they'll say, oh, that's just an allegory of how God wants the relationship between him and the church, Mm -hmm. as opposed to just looking at it as, I mean, that could be, but like, these two people really were digging each other mm-hmm. and obviously having sex. <laughs> <laughs> it is a beautiful depiction of two lovers exchanging these kind, beautiful words. It's poetry. You know, they're talking about how much they care about each other. They're talking about how much they enjoy sex with each other. They're talking with their friends about how fly their lover is. Like, it's a great exchange. It, it's like I said, it's poetry. It's a great exchange between partners um, who are not married. I slept, but my heart was awake. A sound. My beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is wet with dew and my locks with the droplets of the night. I had put off my garment. How could I put it on? I had bathed my feet. How could I soil them? My beloved put his hands to the latch and my heart was thrilled within me. I arose to open to my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. My soul failed me as he spoke. I sought him, but I found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. The watchmen found me as they went about into the city. They beat me, they bruised me, they took away my veil, those watchmen of the walls. I adore you, O daughters of Jerusalem. If you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am sick with love. And so it's thought that it's between King Solomon, who had a whole bunch of wives and a whole bunch of concubines, right? And the Shulamite woman, who is a a Black woman. And I specifically say that she is a Black woman because often in our society, we do not have a lot of examples where someone is specifically Mm -hmm. named as being dark, but also praised for their beauty. And we have a very clear depiction of that in the Bible, in Song of Solomon. 
I think about the end of chapter four going into the beginning of chapter five. And I think that it is possibly alluding to oral sex. And so it's where she is speaking and saying, like, come into my garden, breathe of its fresh fruits and so on and so forth. And then like the beginning of chapter five, he says, I went to the garden and the fruit was delicious. (laughs) 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 And I think about how as a, I think I was 19 or 20 and had a conversation with someone who was a young married woman and just asked, you know, uh, is oral sex a sin? Because it, it was just a, a question that I had. I wanted to know, is is this considered sinful? And I was, I asked specifically, like, even in marriage, is oral sex a sin? And her response was that, I don't know that it's sinful, but I don't think that you should have oral sex because your mouth is used for praise, praise to God. Mm-hmm. And so, like, that's so layered, right? Because it's the idea that genitals are dirty, mm-hmm. Right your mouth is also used to eat. <laughs> I mean, <Right>. like, <laughs> it's so interesting, the hierarchy that, that things are placed on within our own bodies that we place on ourselves, but specifically within religion. And so I'm glad that I kind of just took that and was like, oh, okay. Um, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't like uh, take it to heart, but I know a lot of people who receive these types of teachings, but I am grateful for the end of chapter four and the beginning of chapter five in Song of Solomon, where it gives this, depiction that's like, oh, maybe that's what they were talking about right there. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, I think why that's so important for me, at least, is that there's this idea that missionary sex is like the only sanctioned sex and that in the Bible, that was you. And you're like, that can't be true. That's just, that's not a thing. That was that. Why would God give us all of these amazing nerve endings and (laughs) fingers and toes and mouths and bodies Mm -hmm. and and just expect us to be so limited and, and lack creativity? Well, exactly. And I think about how most people with vulvas need some type of direct clitoral stimulation in order to achieve orgasm. And I believe that the God I serve is a God of purpose. And if the only purpose of the clitoris is pleasure, why would the only sanctioned way to have sex not provide direct stimulation to it? Mm -hmm. Yes. No, I agree with you. Can you just like take a step back? Let's paint a picture of these stories that these collection of stories, of fables, of parables, of potential narratives that are shared and held with such significance for so many. How did we even get this in our hands? Can you give me a sense of like, what is it that we are actually holding? Yeah, yeah. So I'll kind of give the quick and dirty. I'll start with the New Testament. So you have people who knew Jesus as a living, breathing person who walked with him. And some of them wrote their own narratives. Even if they didn't write their narratives, they shared their stories. And then other people, whether they were their progeny or people who knew them, wrote what they learned from these people, right? And so the Gospels were actually not written, not thought to have been written until several years after Jesus was crucified. So it's a possibility that the Gospels that we, the the four books that we refer to as the Gospels, weren't actually specifically written by people who lived and walked with him, but possibly people who knew the people who lived and walked with him. So then you fast forward and you have Paul's letters, which is what we base a lot of our Christian doctrine upon. Paul didn't even know Jesus like that. (laughs) Um, Paul, he's probably a a problematic faith for a lot of people, um, problematic in a lot of ways. He was actually a persecutor of, of Christians. And so he was converted on the road to Damascus. And then from there, he was like a a gung ho Christian, like, you know, just all for it. And so also had the idea that, you know, Jesus is coming back tomorrow. So like we need to get right 
for his return. And the idea was that Jesus's return was imminent. It was it was very close. And so you can almost sense a certain desperation in his letters. And like I said, most of the letters are attributed to Paul, but some are they may be attributed to him, but still thought to possibly have been written by someone else. So a quick interlude. During my crash course into the origins of the Bible in preparation for this conversation, I learned a lot, not only about the content of the book, but the history of the book itself. I'm going to wish through it here to give you all some basic context. If you're interested, please do your own research. My word is certainly not the gospel. The initial draft of the Bible was originally written in Hebrew, and it was translated into Greek in the 3rd century BCE because Greek was the most common language of the time. Then, it stays in circulation in Greek for a long time. Along the way, it gets a bunch of new edits. Some books are added, some taken out, there are letters and poems and stories. Then, around 90 BCE, the Council of Jamnia gathers and decides on the director's cut of the Old Testament, based on three principles. One, historical accuracy. That's history since the beginning of time. Two, the passages are written by a great patriarch. What? That lies our problem, my friend. And three, no passages in conflict with one another. Essentially, whitewashing the content. Then, Jesus comes along and he's using the Old Testament as his Bible. Around 100 CE, Paul starts writing letters also in Greek. At this point, the whole thing is in pieces. Drafts, director's cut, stories here, letters there. It's a work in progress, you know? In the 4th century, Constantine commissions the complete works. He's like, enough with the drafts and the edits, let's have this done. So the OT, the letters, and some additional text goes into one book, and he has 50 of them written by hand. As soon as the 50 books are completed in Greek, scholars start to translate it into a bunch of languages so they can spread the word. At the beginning of the 5th century, a scholar named Jerome translates the Hebrew and the Greek version into Latin, which becomes the Bible. At the time, people are actually speaking in Latin and saying cool stuff like cogito ergo sum. But by the 12th century, Roman Empire has fallen and no one's really speaking Latin anymore. Mostly religious folks and pompous scholars. So the Bible makes it over the channel and gets into the British Isles and starts to be translated into the most common language of the people. Upon hearing this, the religious leaders and rulers get their knickers in a twist because now everyone can actually read the word of God for themselves rather than take their word for it. So they start to ban all these books. Late in the 14th century, the Bible was translated into English, the language of the people at the time, unofficially. At this point, the church is playing whack-a-mole with all these copies. They don't want them around, and the people who have them are taking a huge risk by having them. Plus, everything is still being written by hand, right? There are only a few copies around, and they're expensive as hell. So, we have the Chronicles of God and Jesus by the people written in Hebrew, then translated into Greek along with Paul's letters and a bunch of other texts. Then it gets translated into a bunch of local languages until the whole thing gets translated into Latin and the church covers this version because nobody understands it until it gets unofficially translated into English, but it's super scarce. All this happens over centuries and by hand at a time not many people can actually read and write. Then technology to the rescue. The Gutenberg press was invented in the middle of the 15th century in Germany. Arguably, the most important invention of the modern human civilization, but that's another podcast. And of course, the first book Herr Gutenberg prints is, you guessed it, the Bible in Latin. Likes imagination if you ask me. By the middle of the 16th century, the Latin Bible was translated and printed into 14 languages, mostly European and Nordic. No official English version just yet. Then came along a guy called William Tyndall, who translated the Greek Bibles into English, thus creating the first English New Testament, which was allowed back on mainland. Finally, in 1611, we get the King James Bible, sanctioned by the crown, which is the Bible as we know it today. But 
since the King James Bible, there has been over 900 translations and paraphrases of the Bible, plus 2,000 other translations of the Bible available worldwide. Whew, that's one hell of a journey for one book. I appreciate you framing that because what it means is that the book that we are holding is a book written in different languages, from different cultures, from different people, from different time periods, some of whom may have been there, some of whom heard the stories via telephone, that then came together by another group of people many years later who chose which versions of the books, which books period, and what versions of them and what segments of them should be put together to tell a particular story. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating to me that they seem to all agree that sex is bad and homosexuals right. should be burnt. Be well, burnt. I was going to ask like, that. Along, yeah, the way, <laughs> along the way, the one prevailing thing seems to be that sex is bad. All that. So I'm kind yes. of, in a way, I'm kind of amazed <laughs> that it made it through so many layers and that sex is bad. But nobody along the way were like, guys, we should just like revise this part. What's important to note is that pre-Christian Hebrew faith did not separate the body and the spirit. Like it was one, it was, it was all one. And so when the books of the New Testament were being written, the philosophy of the day was one of asceticism. The idea that in order to get closer to God, you had to separate from the body. So that means that I can't enjoy the pleasures that my body gives in order to be close to God. Now, like I said, that was the philosophy of the day. That idea in itself is inherently not Christian, right? Mm -hmm. But that was the philosophy that was going on as the different books were being written. And so just like an author today Mm -hmm. would infuse different thoughts that are permeating society, Mm -hmm. same thing happened back then. Mm -hmm. And so came into being or came into really fruition that this idea that in order to be close to the Christian God, then I have to separate from the body. I can't enjoy sex. I can't participate in sex outside of procreation. But like I said, in looking at pre-Christian Hebrew religion, that wasn't true. That was the philosophy of the day, which was secular, but it was just kind of gathered up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just, I'm curious, I don't know if you had the answer to this. Is it even recorded to to why that was like the hashtag no body no pleasure in that moment you know like why why were we so against pleasure of the of the body in that period what was triggering this idea that in order to be close to god that you couldn't feel pleasure with your body it comes from platonic and neoplatonic thought plato and his homies had Mm -hmm. this idea about asceticism Asceticism is, it's like a severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgence for religious reasons. It was the idea that the body kind of holds the spirit back from reaching its highest potential. Mm. I mean, that idea is actually in other teachings as well, right? It's in Buddhism, it's in Islam. So this idea that bodies somehow are like flesh and blood somehow gets in the way of our spiritual existence seems to be like seems to prevail for some reason. And I I liked where you said earlier about that you believe in a God of purpose. It just seems like an awful waste of engineering to have our bodies, which are absolutely fascinating, amazingly designed, and to be like, but by the way, it gets in the way. I'm just like, I don't like to me, I don't quite. And I'm not saying that's a Christian idea. It is like it seems to be across all of religious teaching. I just can't understand that, like the reasoning that says your body gets in the way of your spiritual expression. Mm. No, I could get that. I mean, Effie, I think you and I feel that way all the time. We're, we think our humanity and our bodies get in the way of everything. I'm like, oh, sleeping and eating such a waste of time. Like I need, if I could just live in my brain and didn't have to carry this body around, things would be so much better. 
I understand that rationale, but we're moving towards, I think what, what we're trying to figure out now is no actually experiences in the now in our body via our sensation via touch via like i think that actually if 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 a book were going to be written now if the bible was going to be written now i think it would have a very different context because people have that understanding that we have lived in our imagination and in our minds for too long and actually also need to live in our bodies absolutely like i just think about i was talking with a friend yesterday about some uh, peach butter and thinking about how excited I am to go to the orchard to pick peaches this summer. Mm. And I was thinking about the pleasure of biting into a juicy, Mm. ripe peach, right? Love peaches. Mm -hmm. Right? But just thinking about how enjoying that little bit of pleasure allows me to be present in the moment. Mm -hmm. One of my really good friends, she's probably one of the smartest people I know, but she's taught me that all there is is right now. The past is a figment of our imagination and the future. We may not see it. It may not happen, but all there is is right now. And so like when I'm biting into that peach, I am grateful for the bees, right? Pollinating it. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful to God that I picked the right peach that is delicious, (laughs) (laughs) that is juicy just enough. And that makes me think about other religious teachings as well as the ideas of mindfulness and how helpful that can be in helping us to really appreciate and understand our and experience our sexuality as full and complete beings. Yeah. I completely agree with you. That is the Bible message I can get behind. So we know that A, the people who wrote the Bible may not have been there. B, the books and words were created and translated over the course of centuries. And C, when discussed now, many of us do so without real context. It's no wonder that little lessons like this feel like Easter eggs that must be sought out and uncovered. And, you know, a lot of times, though, they're not reading it or they're only reading what is spoon fed to them because it's easier that way. It's easier to just take someone's word at it instead of self-investigation and really trying to figure out, OK, who is this person? And and also I think about how, unfortunately, Christianity has been used to Mm -hmm. uphold systems of white supremacy. But when you look at the root of our faith, it's about justice. It's Mm -hmm. about fighting for who's considered the least of these, those who don't have access to these systems Mm -hmm. of power. It's almost infuriating because it's like, no, my Jesus didn't say that. He didn't do that. (laughs) You know, where did he get this from? It's like uh, when they when Hollywood makes terrible movies of good books, it feels like like the sermons or like that most people digest the Bible and their understanding of faith in their religion is through like terrible, terrible movies of the book. And if they were just to sit and read through the full, you know, trilogy or whatever the, you know, whatever the, the volumes are that you would they would get an entirely different experience. Yes, absolutely. I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. So then let me ask you that kind of as a final question for those who want sexual expression to be a part of their self expression. What do you hope that they find in the Bible that gives them examples and inspiration and comfort? Freedom in Christ. I think about how there's a scripture that says that um, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And that abundant life includes good sex. That abundant life includes freedom to express who you are. That abundant life includes understanding that Psalm 139 applies to me too. It, it, it means that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. How I show up, how I choose to show up in this world is a divine creation and reflection of who God is. Like, that's what I hope people have the opportunity to really understand and grasp for themselves. That's beautiful. Amen to that. Ooh, <laughs> that <laughs> was a bit of a roller coaster. I, 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 I have been to like 
decades of church classes and sermons. And I forgot how crazy some of these biblical stories are, Yeah, which honestly is why it feels all the more upsetting that religion and religious text has been used to shame and marginalized and claim and kill people. I think that for me, these types of conversations help me relook at the text, which has brought mm. me both comfort and deep pain with new eyes and invites me to continue to be curious. For sure. There's a lot of sex in the Bible, more than I actually realized. Unfortunately, in most of the popular tales, sex feels like a literary device for high drama and controversy. It seems to be a means to an end or to scare folks. But in our Easter egg hunt, we were also able to find stories where there's sex for the sake of sex and for the pure pleasure of it. Interested in hearing more? You can follow DeAndrea's work on Instagram at Sankofa Sex and visit her website at www.sankofasextherapy.com. For more from Effie and I, follow Curious Fox at We Are Curious Foxes on Instagram and Facebook. You can listen to behind the scenes, podcast extras, and exclusive offers in our Patreon page. And make sure that your voice is heard by helping us develop episodes that center around your needs and curiosity by emailing us or sending us a voice memo at listening at We Are Curious Foxes or calling us at 201 870 0063. This episode is produced and edited by Nina Pollock, who's the fancy chocolate in our Easter egg basket. Our intro music is composed by Dave Saha. We are so grateful for their work. And we're grateful to you for listening. As always, stay curious, friends. Curious Fox podcast is not and will never be the final word on any topic. We solely aim to encourage curiosity and provide a space for exploration through connection and story. We encourage you to listen with an open and curious mind and we'll look forward to your feedback. Stay curious, friends. Stay curious. 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 Stay curious.